Megan and I had been living together for the past two years and things were going so well that I decided it was time to propose. On Friday, I bought a matching extravagant engagement ring that I thought she would love and hid it until the next morning. I was planning to propose over breakfast. Breakfasts were a special time for the two of us, especially on weekends. Megan and I loved to cook elaborate meals together and then slowly enjoy them for a few hours while sipping coffee, reading the newspaper, and doing the crossword puzzle together. So it seemed only fitting to propose at a time that we both valued. She was deep in reading the editorial page when I felt the time was right. The newspaper in front of her face hid me from her view, so I was able to sneak up to the table and kneel in front of her without attracting attention. I opened the ring box, picked it up in both hands, and noticeably cleared my throat. When she lowered the newspaper and saw me in front of her, her eyes widened in surprise. Megan, I said in my most sincere tone, waking up next to you in the morning and enjoying breakfast together these last two years has been so wonderful that I want to continue to do it for the rest of my life. Please make me the happiest person in New York, agreeing to become my wife. I expected her squeal of joy and a passionate hug, but she just sat there in stunned silence, her face turning redder by the minute. Finally, she took the ring from my hands and looked at it for a long time before returning it to me with a sigh. It's not like I wanted to tell you, Jake, but I was seeing someone else. I was going to move in with him next week, but apparently we'll have to speed up our plans now. I'm sorry. I remained kneeling in front of her, too stunned to speak. She looked at me again. This is a beautiful ring, she said wistfully. She then stood up and went into the bathroom, closing the door behind her. I could hear her cell phone chirping and the sounds of muffled conversation. When the doorbell rang an hour later, Megan hurried to open the door, revealing a tall, handsome guy about my age. While I sat listlessly on the couch in my pajamas, he and she began moving her things out of our apartment and into what I assumed was his car. Neither of them spoke a word to me while they worked, but as she left for the last time, she stopped at the door and cast a pitying glance at me. Live well, Jake, she said quietly, and then she left. I don't remember anything else about that weekend, and if it weren't for my Outlook calendar, I probably wouldn't remember anything about the next week at the law firm. I think, hope, I was able to focus on the cases I had and the clients I saw, but I can't be sure. Over time, however, the opportunity to immerse myself in my profession offered a kind of anesthesia that helped me survive. During the day, I could immerse myself in work, but the nights were hard and breakfasts even harder, especially on weekends. I had no distractions and every aspect of breakfast, cooking, reading the newspaper, doing the crossword puzzle, brought unbearable memories. After a few weeks of suffering, I wanted to do something to try and break the cycle of self-pity I was stuck in. So instead of making my usual lonely breakfast, one cool morning I got dressed and left the apartment in search of another place to eat. I only walked a couple of blocks before I came across a neighborhood cafe that wasn't part of a chain. There was a Manny's sign above the door and a blue neon sign underneath that said, Open for breakfast. The place was surprisingly busy when I walked in, which I took as a good sign. If my neighbors visited this place, then the food must be good, I thought. A man, I later found out he was the owner, came up to me and asked, How many of you will be for breakfast, sir? I felt a twinge of pain when I told him, One. He led me to a table with two chairs against one of the walls and made me sit so that I was facing the door. I liked that he did that because I thought it would be nice to watch people come and go. So I wasn't completely alone, although I was the only one at my table. The menu he gave me was old and covered with a thin, transparent film. Apparently, Manny rarely, if ever, changed his offer. It was somehow calming. The breakfast page had the usual items, eggs, pancakes, sausage, and the like. But in the small square, I spotted Manny's homemade granola and, on impulse, ordered it. The bowl Manny brought was unlike any granola I'd ever seen. It contained lightly cooked whole oats, chunks of almonds and walnuts, and a mixture of dried, uh, cranberries and blueberries. 
I also tasted cinnamon and some other spices that I didn't recognize. At first I was worried that the mixture would be too dry to eat, but after I added a little milk, I found the porridge to be delicious. The hot cup of coffee that Manny brought along was the perfect complement, so Manny's became my regular breakfast spot. Manny soon began to recognize me, and when I walked in, he automatically led me to the same small table against the wall and brought me coffee and homemade granola, no questions asked. I started to feel comfortable. It wasn't as good as eating breakfast with Megan, but it was much better than eating alone in your apartment. One day, this morning, after I had already sat down, I noticed that several customers had gathered at the entrance, waiting for a table. I thought for a moment and then beckoned to Manny. If it helps, I'd be happy to share my table with someone else, I told him. He nodded his thanks and walked over to the customers at the door. A minute later, he brought a middle-aged man to me, saying, This gentleman doesn't mind sharing a table. The man nodded to me in gratitude, and after he placed his order, he took out his newspaper and began to read. So did Megan, I smiled to myself, and this time the memory didn't seem so painful. From then on, whenever Manny started to fill up, I would keep an eye out for single customers, wave at them, and invite them to take an unused seat at my table. Most of my breakfast companions, acknowledging my offer, ate in silence, but a few took advantage of the opportunity to strike up conversation. If the conversation turned to politics or other controversial topics, I would retreat behind my newspaper, but sometimes the other person would address me like an old friend, speaking familiarly about life, family, and other topics, sometimes of a rather personal nature. The anonymity of this chance meeting seemed to lower the usual barriers, and my interlocutor freely expressed his feelings without feeling embarrassed. Sometimes I talked about my experience with Megan, but more often I just listened, following up the conversation with a question or two to show my new companion that I was truly interested. I began to look forward to these meetings. They became a new and unexpectedly pleasant entertainment. Growing up in Manhattan, I was accustomed to ignoring strangers, never making eye contact, let alone starting a conversation. Now, although sharing intimate details around a table still felt a lion, I found these brief, non-committal exchanges attractive. One busy Saturday, I noticed an intense-looking man in a restaurant and immediately waved for him to join me. A look of relief appeared on his face and he hurried over to my table. I was afraid I wouldn't be able to find you, he said quickly because I didn't know what you looked like. I immediately realized that he must have been looking for someone else, but before I could correct him, a strange feeling came over me. I had, I realized, an opportunity to take my little game in a new direction. It was a risk, but I could always fall back on the mistaken identity excuse if things went wrong. I decided to try it. I didn't know how to recognize you either, I said but I was sure it was you when you came in. He nodded with satisfaction, then sat down, obviously waiting for me to make the next move. What to say? What to say? So, I said, trying not to sound nervous. Everything ready? He looked at me with bewilderment. Yes, if you are comfortable with the price. I looked at him closely. About the price, I don't know if I can go that high. The intense man became anxious. I thought we had an agreement. He pulled out a handkerchief and wiped his forehead. Returning it to his pocket, he looked at me again with a pleading expression. Look, 500 is a good price, you have to admit. Yes, I admitted, but 400 would be even better. He looked offended, but I felt that it was insincere. You're killing me. 400 is below my costs. I decided to play with him. Okay, then how about 450? The speed of his response confirmed that I had read the situation correctly. 450? My wife would kill me. But okay, I'll do it for you. 450. Cash. He extended his hand across the table to me, but I did not immediately take it. 450 in cash, but only after I received the item, I said firmly. Of course, he said and grabbed my hand. Just come see me tomorrow night at five hours and it'll be all yours. You won't regret it. Then he looked at his watch. Listen, I have to run. 
It was a pleasure doing business with you. Don't forget, tomorrow at five o'clock and bring cash with you. I nodded, and when he stood up, he took my bill along with his. It's on me, he said with a wink before heading to the cash register to pay. He's too happy with the deal, I thought to myself. I bet he only put 300 into it, whatever it is. All that day, I could not get this episode out of my head. Sometimes I felt anxious about what I had done. What happens if I don't show up tomorrow at five hour with cash? Will he look for me at Manny's? But the rational part of me noted this concern. As far as the guy knew, our meeting was a one-time thing and in a neutral place. He didn't know my name or where I lived. Besides, what harm was done? He lost nothing except the cost of my breakfast. He still had it, and someone there offered him 500 for it. But what really fascinated me was how I could intervene in another person's life. Even in our brief interaction, I felt like I had a real insight into his personality, a window into his mind. I also found myself pleased with my ability to think on my feet and couldn't help but hope for similar experiences in the future. To be honest, I skipped a few days of visiting Manny's, just in case Mr. Wheel of Fortune showed up looking for me. But I missed homemade granola, and when I resumed my daily breakfasts at Manny's, nothing bad happened. I decided that all this was a one-time incident, and sternly told myself that it was for the best. As might be expected, nothing even close to this experience happened over the next few months. So, I was taken by surprise by what happened one Wednesday in the spring. I was enjoying my coffee when I looked up and noticed an extremely attractive woman with long blonde hair entering the restaurant. She was wearing a sleeveless summer dress, and although the daytime temperature had warmed pleasantly, the morning was still quite chilly. She started looking around worriedly, and I quickly stood up, waved, and pointed to the empty seat at my table. Without hesitation, she approached me. I was so fascinated by her that I didn't know what to say and she seemed to have similar insecurities. She then reached out and gave me a friendly hug and a kiss on the cheek. A brief whiff of her perfume almost made me sway. After we sat down and she ordered, coffee only, thank you, she tilted across the table. You don't look anything like your photo, she said in a low voice, so only I could hear. Then she smiled. You should really get another one. You're much more attractive than I expected. Now I thought I understood what was happening. You, on the other hand, look exactly like your photograph, and I thought it was beautiful, I replied. She blushed shyly. We sat there in silence for a moment. Then she looked into my eyes and I felt that she was uncomfortable. I don't know what you might think of me, she said suddenly. I've never done this before. Me too, I said honestly, and I'm a little unsure how we should proceed. This seemed to calm her down, and she perked up a bit. Your real name is Lance? she asked. I looked at her seriously. No, I admitted. That's not true. I wanted to protect my identity because you never know what weird things you might encounter. Then I gave her a playfully piercing look. You're not an oddity, are you? No, she laughed cheerfully. And Deidre is not my real name either but I always thought it was a beautiful, romantic name, and it seemed like a good opportunity to become Deidre. Then Deidre, so be it, I said, and I will be your Lancelot, and we will have wonderful adventures together. I made a half bow while sitting at the table, and she pretended to bow back. How do we begin this adventure, dear lady? I asked. Maybe we could just go for a little walk and get to know each other better, she suggested and I quickly agreed. Just let me call the office and let them know I'll be late, I told her, and she gave me that wonderful smile again. As we walked down the street, I took off my jacket and threw it over her shoulders to protect her from the cold. She accepted it gratefully, and I could see that she was pleased with my gesture of chivalry. We reached Central Park and began walking south along Fifth Avenue. It seemed natural to take her hand, and she happily held mine. As the sun shone through the young leaves, we began to talk. At first, we chatted about neutral topics, like the weather and the news, but after some time, she started talking about her upbringing and then her marriage. 
I listened to what I had learned to do at Manny and continued to encourage her with questions and comments. She met her husband while they were both at university and married him immediately after graduation. He was a good man, decent and kind. But it was clear that his passion for his career was not conducive to their relationship at all. He didn't want her to work, so while he made deals in distant cities, she stayed at home, trying to find some satisfaction in continuing her education and volunteering. As Deirdre described, his passion for his work exceeded his passion for it. I began to understand how otherwise a modest and decent wife could so deeply miss the romance and passion that she so lacked that she dared to seek it from a stranger. I looked up and saw that we had reached the statue of General Sherman. The Plaza Hotel towered in front of us. I looked at Deirdre and made a decision. Come with me, I said firmly, and she followed with no doubt. The room was overpriced, but I didn't care. I was paying for romance and a unique experience, both for her and for myself. Now that we were there, she stood in front of me hesitantly. This was the moment of truth, and it confused her. I'm not sure why I'm here. She started to hesitate, but I wasn't going to let her talk me out of it. You know perfectly well why you are here, I said decisively. You are here because you have needs that are not being met. You are here because you want the passion and excitement that you lack in your boring, everyday life. And you are here because I want you more than anyone else, ever before. She sighed and I decided it was time to act. Take off your dress, I ordered, and, as I hoped, she obediently complied. The dress only hinted at how beautiful her body really was, and I wanted to take it in with my eyes. I walked around her, examining her, taking off my shirt and tie. She stood there silently, but I noticed that her breathing had quickened. When we finally came to our senses, we went back to the bathroom and showered together. After getting dressed and checking our appearance, we left the room and went downstairs. As we walked out into the sunlight of Grand Army Plaza, she turned to me and stopped. I want to see you again, she said, and my thoughts began to spin. The whole accident was fun for me a chance encounter that I couldn't resist but didn't plan on repeating. However, something about Deirdre touched me deeply. Yes, she was amazing. And yes, the sex was amazing. But I felt like there was something more, a deeper connection. At the same time, the alarm siren was sounding in my head. She's married. You don't want to get involved in an affair. Nothing good will come of it. I knew that all this was true but something in me was more drawn to her. I grabbed her hands so we were face to face. I really want this, I told her sincerely. We only took a few minutes to plan. We agreed to meet again in a week, but this time in a more private place. I gave her the name and address of a small boutique hotel, and we agreed on a time. She hugged me tightly and kissed me passionately, then jumped into a waiting taxi to return to her car. As the taxi pulled away, she rolled down the window. I can't wait, she said breathlessly, and then she was gone. As I rode in the taxi to the law firm, I continued to relive the morning. I could never imagine such a meeting. Now I couldn't stop thinking about her. My initial elation soon gave way to guilt. I deceived her, met her under false pretenses, but after several minutes of shame, I suddenly realized that I was wrong. She intended to meet a stranger, someone she didn't know. True, I wasn't the one who responded to her invitation on some website or chat, but who cares? I was a stranger. We met, and something special happened between us. Oh, how much we coincided. The process by which we found each other was unimportant, no more significant than if we had met by chance in a bar. I spent the next week thinking about her. Time seemed to drag on forever. But when the appointed date finally arrived, I was waiting for Deirdre on the sidewalk in front of the small hotel, 15 minutes before the appointed time. I had already booked the room, not wanting to waste our time together. When her taxi pulled up to the curb, I was there to open the door for her and saw how happy she was. We walked into the lobby hand in hand, but as we entered the elevator, she let go of my hand, looked at the floor, and said in a quiet voice, Sorry to keep you waiting. You're going to? Punish me? 
I instantly understood what she wanted and returned to my dominant role. I will decide what is appropriate, not you, I said sharply. She didn't say anything, but I thought I saw a hint of approval on her lips. As soon as we entered the room, she stood in front of the bed and silently stood in front of me, folding her hands in front of her and lowering her eyes. Take off your blouse and skirt, but keep your underwear and shoes, I demanded in a stern tone. She did it quickly, and I almost gasped out loud. Her conservative outfit hid incredible lingerie and smoky black stockings. When she finished, she returned to her previous position without looking at me. I sat down on the bed next to her. I'm not going to punish you because discipline is for adults. But today you were late like a schoolgirl and deserve to be punished like a naughty girl, I said. I saw her shaking, but before she could speak, I grabbed her and pulled her into my lap. I then began to stroke her bare buttocks with my hand, being careful not to leave bruises, but making sure to turn her ass bright red. She began to whimper, and I saw tears flowing from her eyes. I quickly grabbed her by the shoulders and turned her over so she was lying face down on the bed. I then grabbed the pillows from the head of the bed and shoved them under her hips, lifting her up and supporting her. Your punishment is not over yet, I warned her ominously. I'm not sure if I blacked out, but when I fully came to, I rolled her over so that we were out of the pillows and spooning together. I took out a sheet and covered both of us, and we lay there for a long time. She raised her hand to take mine and began to stroke my fingers. Suddenly she turned to look at me. I can't believe... She started, but trailed off. I've never... She tried again, and stopped again. Finally she said, It was like, this incredible... I kissed her lips softly. And for me, too, I told her. A little later we made love again. This time it was gentle and affectionate, each of us enjoying the intimacy of the moment and the opportunity to please the other. It was different, but no less satisfying, than the wild passion we had experienced earlier. Later I was the one who asked, Can you come next week? Oh, yes, she replied instantly. She lowered her eyes for a moment then looked deeply into my eyes. I've been thinking about this all last week. I couldn't wait to be with you today, and now I need you even more. I hugged her. I feel exactly the same, I told her. We planned our meetings, and then I took her to the street and stopped a taxi for her. I watched her drive away, and before she was out of sight, I saw her turn and blow me a kiss through the back window. Throughout the day, my thoughts were confused. I thought about Deirdre and worried about what would happen to her husband. I thought about myself and was amazed at what I had gotten myself into. But above all, my thoughts and fears hovered the confidence that I really loved her. This realization gave me confidence that we would find a way to make sense of this confusing chaos and be together. On Friday morning, when I walked into Manny's for breakfast, the place began to fill with customers, and soon there was a line of people waiting to be seated. I noticed a man looking around for a seat and waved him over to my table. He quickly came and sat down, and after he ordered his coffee, he looked at me strangely. I didn't know if you were ready to see me, he said. Another one, I thought to myself and smiled internally. I knew what to say to start the conversation. Of course I would be glad, I told him with confidence. Why not? Then I sat and waited. I learned long ago the power of silence to make others speak. After an awkward silence, he sighed, and I knew I had succeeded. It's complicated, he said, but here's the thing. I want you to stop seeing my wife. A cold metal hand seemed to squeeze my chest. Oh my God, I thought. It's Deirdre's husband. I didn't say a word, simply because I was so overwhelmed by meeting him that I didn't know what to say. Finally, he continued. I know I haven't been the best husband and haven't given her the time and attention she deserves, but the fact is, I love her, and I want you to stop seeing her. Now I need to speak. I don't know if I can do this, I said slowly, because I'm in love with her too. He stared at me in amazement. No, you're not in love, he objected. You're just using her. She's just a piece of flesh for you, a way to satisfy your desires. This made me angry. You couldn't be more wrong, 
I said decisively. I love her, and more importantly, she loves me too. Then he stood up, and I stood up too, so that he would not have the advantage. His face was burning with anger. I noticed other people in the restaurant looking at us curiously. He shook his finger in my face. I'm warning you, he said. Stay away from her. I mean it. I thought he might hit me, but he turned away as if he was going to leave, and I let my guard down. Suddenly he turned around and hit me square in the jaw before I could defend myself. The blow knocked me off my feet and stunned me. Half fainting, I looked up and saw him standing over me menacingly. It's over! Stay away from her! He shouted. I raised my hands trying to protect myself from the next blow, but he turned and walked out the door into the stream of people outside. Manny hurried towards me. Are you okay? He asked anxiously. Do you need an ambulance? Should I call the police? No, I said, getting to my feet. I think I'll be fine. Sit down, he said, and I was happy to comply. He quickly returned with a bag of ice. Fold this on your jaw, he ordered. This will help reduce the swelling. So I sat there confused, holding an ice pack to my sore jaw, while the other patrons pretended not to notice me. Colleagues at the office were concerned when I showed up there that afternoon with bruises and a swollen face, but after I told them I had been attacked by a crazed hobo, they started teasing me for getting into a fight with weirdos. If only they knew. Luckily, Manny's ice helped reduce the swelling and bruising, so after a few days it didn't look like I'd been hit. My jaw still hurt when touched, but I was relieved that it wasn't as noticeable because I didn't want to scare Deirdre. If her husband attacks me again, I will be ready. In a strange way, I was relieved after running into him. Now all the cards were on the table, and Deirdre and I no longer needed to hide. If she agreed, I was going to ask her to move in with me. There was no longer any reason to keep up the pretense. I even rearranged the furniture in my apartment a little to make room for Deirdre's things. To be honest, the apartment was too big for one person, so I was sure that she would feel comfortable in it. On the day of our next meeting, I couldn't wait to tell her about my actions, and again I found myself on the sidewalk in front of the hotel half an hour before the appointed time. The expected time passed more slowly, and I became increasingly impatient, pacing back and forth. Finally, the taxi arrived, but when I opened the door, an elderly couple who appeared to be from out of town got out. The luggage that the taxi driver pulled out of the trunk confirmed my suspicions. I continued my aimless walks, trying to distract myself by thinking about what I would say to Deirdre when she arrived. Depending on her reaction, we might even go straight to my place so I could show her the apartment, I thought with pleasure. After some time, I stopped my little fantasies to check the time and was shocked to find that the time for the scheduled appointment had already passed. What could have happened to her? She was probably late getting home, or perhaps her taxi was stuck in traffic, I reasoned at first. Then the paranoia began. What if her husband did something to her? No, this was a crazy idea, I told myself. He loved her. He would never hurt her. But what if he convinced her to return to marriage? What if she hit her head and lost her memory? What if she was abducted by aliens? Scenarios began to multiply in my head until I felt dizzy. I walked into the hotel and sat in the lobby. In the end, I waited two full hours before I admitted to myself that she wasn't coming. I called the law firm and told them I was sick and wouldn't be in until tomorrow. Then I returned to my apartment and lay down on the sofa. The truth is that I really felt bad, but I didn't get a chance to rest. I scolded myself for my stupidity. Thanks to my oh-so-clever little games, I didn't know Deirdre's real name, didn't know where she lived, didn't have her phone number, and didn't have any other way to contact her. Oh, God, I realized. She has no way of finding me either. The next week was hellish. Every morning I went to Manny's in vain hope Deirdre will suddenly appear. I carefully planned my schedule in the office, so that I could stand on the sidewalk in front of the small hotel at the appointed time, in case the magic taxi appeared with her inside. I even walked past the Plaza Hotel in my despair. My vigilance was in vain. Every failure seemed to make the situation worse. The hole in my heart was now bigger than the one Megan had left, and this time immersing myself in work did not bring relief. 
The following week, one of the senior partners came into my office. Do you have a minute? He asked. My neighbor, Martin Sizemore, came to the office. He and his wife are looking for legal help. I would like to help them, but I have a big court case coming up. Would you like to see what you can do for them? Of course, I said. Junior partners always agree to help their senior colleagues. I put on my jacket and we walked down the corridor to one of the conference rooms. My partner opened the door and I stepped inside, only to stop in shock. On the other side of the table stood Deirdre's husband. He also recognized me and looked at me with obvious displeasure. My partner was completely unaware of our reactions when he introduced us, and Mr. Sizemore and I reluctantly shook hands as a sign of social etiquette. While my partner chatted politely, I began to collect my thoughts and suddenly a wave of adrenaline rushed through me. Mr. and Mrs. Sizemore, that meant Deirdre was here. We can finally reunite and deal with her husband once and for all. As if reading my thoughts, my partner asked the question I wanted to ask. Where is Mrs. Sizemore? She's in the ladies' room, Martin Sizemore replied. She should be back in a minute. Great, my partner replied. Well, I'll leave you in Jacob's capable hands. And he left the conference room. Sizemore and I exchanged glances, and this time I was also silent. Him too. Just as the tension became almost unbearable, the door opened and an attractive but rather curvy woman with short brown hair walked in. I stared at her in confusion. When she didn't say anything, I rudely demanded, Who are you? She was clearly offended by my tone. I am, of course, Sarah Sizemore, she said, offended. And who are you? Martin Sizemore looked at us both in surprise. You don't know her? He asked me suspiciously. I've never seen her in my life, I said with conviction. Sarah Sizemore was becoming increasingly irritated. What's happening? She demanded. Who is this man, Martin? And how do you know him? Neither of us answered. We just stood there staring at each other. Finally, I knew what I needed to do. Mr. Sizemore, would you mind coming with me? Mrs. Sizemore, if you'll excuse us for a moment, please. She looked at us with confusion which only intensified when her husband followed me outside. I walked into the senior partner's office with Sizemore carefully following me. I think he expected me to hit him at the first opportunity. I walked into my partner's office and Sizemore walked in carefully behind me. There's a problem, I said, and I won't be able to represent the Sizemores. There was a legal issue that involved she them some time ago. I was working for another firm at the time and was representing the other side in this case. As you can imagine, the Sizemores would have been quite awkward working with me under these circumstances. My partner looked a little embarrassed, but muttered, Of course, Jacob. Of course. Martin. I'll find someone else to help you. Before I left, I shook Martin Sizemore's hand again. He gave me a look that was a strange combination of embarrassment, apology, and relief. I never saw him again. I didn't go back to my office. Instead, I told my secretary that I had a sudden meeting outside the office and got into a taxi to go home. Once there, I collapsed onto the couch and stared at the wall. I felt as if I had woken up from a dream that was so realistic that I could not tell what was fiction and what was memory. Now I don't like eating breakfast at Manny's. I can't stand sitting at the same table, seeing the same menu, watching strangers walk through the door, looking for a seat. Everything about this place brings back vivid, painful memories that tear at my heart and baffle my mind. It's a pain. But what else can I do? Suddenly one day Deirdre will come in. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.